so meaningful, so impactful, poignant, emotional, and exciting on the 3D printing. My goodness, all kinds of great information as promised tonight. I want to reintroduce myself to all of you. My name is Susan Salcedo, and I serve as the Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools. And in just a few moments, each of the panelists will come up here uh, one by one, and they're going to introduce their organization, share about their mission and goals, and share a little bit about what your funds have been doing for as an impact in their organization. And then after they each come up, I'll be back to moderate some of the questions for each of them to respond to. Um, but before we do that, the Women's Fund, I, I, I want to pause and simply say thank you. Uh, thank you so much for not only organizing this incredible educational event that has a packed room tonight on such an important topic, but the impact that you make Year upon year, I saw in your brochure, you're celebrating 15 years. When I opened up the pamphlet, it said, cheers, or something like this. Or it says it right there on your inside um, jacket. And so truly a celebration of 15 years of important heavy lifts that you do that I just want to say from a community member's point of view that it is noticed and it's seen and it is felt and so needed through our community. And we really do thank you so much for your impact year over year for our uh, community, truly. So I was asked by the Women's Fund to talk a bit about the homelessness as it affects our schools. So I'll take for just a few moments and talk about our county schools for a brief few minutes before handing this on to our panelists. So as you heard earlier from Janice, we do have 20 school districts in Santa Barbara County. And I just, I know most of you or all of you know the geography of Santa Barbara County, but we'll say that if you're driving from Carpinteria the, up the 101 to Santa Maria and took a right to Cuyama or took a left to Guadalupe, those would be the boundaries of Santa Barbara County and so within it, we have 120 elementary, junior high, and high schools. We have 20 school districts and 16 charter schools. And all of our school districts are, all of our school districts are impacted by poverty and homelessness, and a significant number are impacted significantly by poverty and homelessness. It's not just a North County issue, a Mid County issue, or South at all, as you well know as you well know. So we have 70,000 public school students in all of those school districts that I just explained. And I truly believe, as you were talking about the heart, and I believe this to my core too, that our students are full of creativity and imagination and they want to achieve and get to their highest outcome possible. And they come from a wide variety of backgrounds and cultures and come with identities that are just beautiful in multifaceted ways. And that they all deserve every opportunity, every chance for equity and access for, for as, as much as any other student across the nation and across the world. That's what we want for our children in our schools. And yet, as we discussed, and as you have heard tonight, the statistics are profound in terms of poverty and homelessness as it affects our youth in our schools. Our county has more families who qualify for free and reduced lunch than the statewide average. To qualify for free lunch, and you've heard lots of different ways of qualifying for certain things, but to qualify for free and reduced lunches and free milk in our schools, a family of four would need to make not more than $33,475 a year, okay? And our county has 63% of our families in public schools who qualify for free and reduced lunch. In the South County, I just isolated South County only for a moment, 
Carpinteria Unified School District has over 60% of its families qualify for free and reduced lunch. Santa Barbara Unified has over 52% of its families qualify for free and reduced lunch. And Goleta has more than 40% of its families qualify for free and reduced lunch. So if we take it to now homelessness, we heard earlier that uh, Santa Barbara County, as compared to the 57 other counties in California, has the second highest percentage of homelessness for our youth in our schools, in our schools. The largest number of homeless youth in our districts throughout our county, so I'm just going to talk about some of the districts with the highest numbers of homeless students, include Santa Barbara Unified, Santa Maria, both Bonita and Joint Union High School districts, Lompoc, and then that's followed by Carpinteria. So at SBCEO, at the Santa Barbara County Education Office, we are all on liftoff. Do you feel, do you hear this? Yes, we're all on liftoff now. Uh, this is how we ascend to the next step. But at Santa Barbara County Education Office, we are very, very fortunate to have uh, an individual who serves transitional youth and supports all of the district's transitional youth support liaisons. That person is named Dolores Daniel. She is our transitional youth services manager and she's here tonight and I'd really like to call her out. Would you mind standing so everybody can see you, Dolores? Yes. Thank you, Dolores. Thank you. Dolores is truly exceptional. I hope you all get it. You might need a table on your own, Dolores, because people are going to want to have Q&A with you. But really exceptional and is one of our, um, she's our manager of transitional youth services. And what she does is communicates with the district's liaison so that they can support students in their schools. She convenes with administrators, teachers, teams of folks, placement agencies, multi-different groupings of individuals to support students as they're enrolling in class in schools or as they're taking classes in schools. There's multiple ways of support that Dolores Daniel provides from the county education office. And Dolores recently uh, uh, provided a training to education leaders from Santa Barbara County. And I pulled some of the general pieces. These are very general and broad, but it gives you an, ex an idea of some of the tips that she might share with educators in the county. So here are some. Dolores was sharing that transitional students uh, tend to lack privacy. They might be doubled up or tripled up in a home or an apartment or might be in different shelter type of situations. And they then lack, lack privacy or lack a place to study or lack a place to work on projects. They may have inadequate sleeping accommodations so when they go to school, super fatigued and not able to concentrate. They have an inability to, some have an inability to store their belongings, so a lack of space for their school supplies and clothes. If they're in a motel or if they're in a car, they might not have access to fresh food, perishable food. And then if you're in a shelter, which is a wonderful place to have some shelter, you might have some issues with self-image or peer relationships because at a certain age you do a lot of let's come over to my house and we'll do some studying let's go to your house and we'll do some playing and that becomes an issue finally i'll say one thing that dolores really um, punctuated and emphasized with the group is that um, because when when students are transitional and they're going from school to school What's wonderful about some of our elementary schools or our elementary settings is that you have one teacher, one class, and as Jennifer talked about, there's a lot of sense of belonging and connectedness because it's one classroom in, one, in, one, in the school. But once you hit junior high and high school, when you have six classes a day, it's easier to feel a little lost. And so I really appreciate the services that Dolores provides, but also the entities that are sitting here that allow for these students who could go unnoticed to be visible and noticed and served in really important ways throughout Santa Barbara County. So with that, 
I'll, pa I'll stop there and ask our panelists to come forward. We'll start first with Tessa Maddenstorms. Hi there. I'm just going to hold it, I think. I'm also pretty loud, so I might not need too much. So if I, if I drop it, hopefully you'll be able to hear me. Um, as, um, as Susan mentioned, my name is Tessa Madden Storms. Um, and as Janice so lovely introduced us, um, I'm the regional director for PATH here in Santa Barbara. Um, so for those of you who might not be familiar, who we didn't see at um, the grantee presentation earlier this year, um, PATH is actually a statewide agency committed to ending homelessness for individuals, families, and communities. Um, so we do that by focusing on moving people off the streets and out of the shelter system and into their own permanent homes. Here locally, our program is focused on an 100 bed interim housing facility that's located at Cacique in Milpas, a, a facility that many of you might be more familiar with as Casa Esperanza. Um, so PATH came into this community a little over four years ago, merged with Casa Esperanza and began our programming here in Santa Barbara. Um, so a, a number of kind of the, the strongholds have stayed the same, but we've a little bit shifted our approach to how we um, serve and house um, our homeless neighbors. So um, the core of our programming is focused around, again, this interim housing facility. So 100 beds of transitional interim housing as we're working to get people into their own permanent homes. We partner with the city, the county, Cottage Health, um, and really provide a wraparound care for the folks who live in our facility. Um, this includes um, a comprehensive range of supportive services, case management, housing location, healthcare services, um, and employment location and services, all focused on helping the individuals we serve really move out of our facility and into a place that they can truly call home, live independently and stably. Um, in the past four years, we've helped about 400 of our homeless neighbors move off the streets and into their own homes. Um, and we're really proud of that. So before I say a little bit more, I wanted to share the story of one of the, the, the women and her daughter who we have served recently. Thank you. My name is Renee and I'm a client with PATH and this is Aurora and she's two weeks old. I was born and raised in Santa Barbara. Um, I have a past of being a, an addict and being on the streets. The day that I found out that I, um, I got the apartment, I cried because it was a huge burden that was lifted. Um, I don't have to struggle anymore. I don't have to be surrounded with chaos. Um, I can shut my door and be okay. Path has been there and helped me throughout the entire time. They are a huge part of why I was able to do what I'm doing now. And there's no way I could have been able to get into a place as fast as I, I did without them. There's no way that I would have seen my own potential without the, the counseling that I've had. It's a gift for me to be able to be a mom again. So I just wanted to share that to put a little bit of a face um, to the people that we serve and the people that you all in this room are helping by supporting PATH. Um, Renee was actually pregnant when she came to PATH. Um, and when we shot that video, her baby was two weeks old. Um, so um, we're so proud of those types of successes. And like Renee, there's 399 plus more people that we've been able to get into their homes new homes and, and to live independently, but there's there's equally as many as we all know and we've heard from our our speakers that, that that's not their story and that we're working so hard to to help them con to, to continue to help them to find housing. Um, so Jennifer alluded to um, one of our new programs that we've been at, able to add to our portfolio, um, our Zillow-like platform um, that really helps connect our homeless neighbors to existing housing resources. So this is a program called Lease Up. Um, and thanks to some new funding that's come down from the state level, um, we were able to launch this program a couple of months ago. Um, it's not quite fully, fully up and running yet, but we're really excited for 
for it. Um, and it's really a kind of two part, two part program. So it's the newest addition to our programming at Path Santa Barbara. And this program is going to continue to help more people make it home by engaging landlords um, in helping break stigmas of what it's like to, ha to lease and rent to someone who's transitioning off the streets. Um, it helps provide mediation and kind of services. Our staff actually steps in as kind of a mediator between the landlord and the person that we're serving. Um, and also there's this really exciting tech component um, that is a platform. It's something that we actually were able to develop in-house at PATH. Um, we piloted the program in Los Angeles and we're lucky enough to be able to bring it here to this community next. Um, and it really does. It, it looks and functions very much like a, like a Zillow for specifically for units that are available um, to people who have transitioned off the streets. So landlords who are committed to accepting the various subsidies, which we'll get into a little later in our conversation, but um, the various subsidies that our um, homeless residents uh, might have to, to offer. So um, we're really excited to add that. Um, and just to close, I just want to say thank you again to this whole room. We're so committed to this community and people like you inspire us to continue to do our great work. So um, the grant that we received from you all this year was $50,000 for new beds and mattresses for the ladies that we serve. Um, just an update, we've um, purchased all the new mattresses and we are um, just waiting on the bed order and going to get everything installed and rehabbed and we're excited to have our dorms and our living areas looking fresh and fabulous thanks to you all. So we so appreciate it um, and we'll talk a little bit more, kind of get in the weeds about some of um, the issues that Jennifer mentioned later. So thank you guys so much. Um, we're about halfway through the program, I think. So if anybody needs to stretch while I'm talking or stand up or do anything, I, I, um, I'm all for it to keep everybody going. So thank you uh, so much for having us and for the support that you've given Transition House. It's wonderful to see so many of our friends that are here in the audience today. I want, you to, I want to tell you a little bit about what Transition House does, if um, you're not aware, and then talk to you about a few of the clients that we have currently in our shelter. I very much appreciate the introduction from Jennifer. I think she gave you an excellent overview of how we got here. I'm going to speak on behalf of um, the other social services providers that are here with me and say that our agencies cannot solve the problems that created this situation. That's why we need you. We have to do it as a community. We have to do it through community activism and advocacy. What our agencies do is we try to provide relief to the people that are, are victims um, of these circumstances that create poverty. So Transition House is different from PATH. PATH um, serves individuals, and Transition House is a sheltering program for homeless families with children. We um, serve local community members and we operate not only our emergency shelter but a long-term transitional and permanent housing program as well. We offer a full continuum of anti-poverty services designed to address all aspects of economic disadvantages that are suffered by families that lose their housing. And Transition House believes in the power of transformation for those whose homelessness was caused by issues such as domestic violence, lack of education, intergenerational poverty and dysfunction, crime, substance abuse, and other behavioral root causes. That is why we offer families the time and support that they need in our programs to develop the life skills they require to truly change their lives. And it is why we require program participation, including maintaining sobriety and improving their income earning potential. So here's how we do this. When families enter Transition House's shelter, they are in crisis and they're experiencing significant levels of trauma. We use a trauma-informed care methodology to help them. And what that means is that we don't want to re-traumatize them when they move into shelter as serious trauma has physiological effects that can literally keep someone from being able to take action. So that old adage that you might hear, that prejudice, why don't you just get a job? Well, it's true, I really can't until I deal with, with some of the experiences that led me to this place in my life. Uh, during the first week that they're in shelter, we are careful not to overload them with too many expectations. We work to be caring and to build trust with them. Within two weeks, parents begin working with a dedicated case manager to develop goals and long-term plans to return to economic self-sufficiency. 
They receive job counseling from our employment specialists and attend classes in career development. They also take classes as needed in computer skills, parenting skills, and if needed, English as a second language. They work with our staff on budgeting and credit cleanup. And in fact, while they're at Transition House, they're required to save 80% of their expendable income. So they'll have the money to um, pay a security deposit and first month's rent when they go back to housing. We also eliminate one of the greatest barriers to stability for low-income parents by providing free or subsidized child care. We work with partnering agencies that provide services for mental health issues, recovery, or other clinical services if the family needs them. Families that stay um, at, in Transition Houses Shelter are there for usually about four months. They have a place to sleep, three nutritious meals a day, basic needs provided for, and it allows them the opportunity to save money and concentrate on improving their ability to increase their income earning potential and effectively compete in today's job market. At Transition House, we are also aware that statistics show children growing up in homeless families are more likely, three to four times more likely, in fact, to become homeless as adults. They experience higher levels of academic failure, health problems, behavioral issues, and lower self-esteem than their housed peers. Transition House provides quality children's programs, including on-site free licensed child care or infant care, free on-site tutoring, evening arts enrichment programs, a literacy and technology program, and a teen program focusing on emotional and social issues, along with preparing them for college. So our best measure of success is the number of families who leave the shelter and move to permanent rental housing. Now, over um, each year, over 70% of our shelter families are able to achieve this. So why do area families become homeless? Um, and I want to give you a few examples from case files that I grabbed this morning and read um, quickly to give you an idea of who's in our shelter right now. So these are a few. We have a grandmother who's caring for her schizophrenic daughter and two grandchildren. She lost her home due to a structure fire and had no friends who could house her family. This grandmother can't work as she's partially deaf and she lives off of Social Security. We have a single mom with two children who could no longer stay with her sister. She was working, but her car broke down and she did not have the money to repair it. So she lost her job due to her lack of transportation. Without income, she can't rent an apartment. We have another single mom with an infant who became homeless when her abusive alcoholic husband lost his job and they lost their home. Gladly, she left him, but she entered shelter. Another family is a single mom with two children separated from her husband who could not find a job earning enough money to pay all of her monthly expenses on her own, although she is working. While she has child support from him, her income still is not enough to successfully house her family. We have a single dad with two kids working part-time who lost his housing when the relative that he lived with died and he could not afford rent on his own. His monthly income is $2,100. It's not enough to afford rent and food for his family. So it gives you some idea of um, some of the circumstances. A lot of the people that um, we help are working. They are underemployed. Um, they're not able to, um, even if they're fully employed, pay um, the high cost of rent here in the area. So um, in addition to the 16, or in addition, um, out of the 16 families we currently have in our shelter, three are there because landlords decided to remodel their apartments so they can potentially charge more rent in the future and the families were asked to leave. There are currently 37 families on our wait list. Several have been victims of domestic violence. Many simply can't find work or they do work but they can't earn enough to afford housing. So what do we do to help them? Well, generally speaking, um, along with all the services I listed earlier, what we will do is try to help the families that can increase their income, lower their expenses, and find housing that they can afford. They'll get a lot of, of help learning how to budget what they do have. And in cases where we have a family that's on a fixed income, such as the grandmother I mentioned, we will try to get her placed in subsidized housing because she doesn't have the ability to earn more money. So in closing, we'd like to thank the Women's Fund pro for providing us with funding to bridge the gap um, that was created over the last couple of years when we lost over 300,000 in annual HUD funding that we had been accustomed to being provided. And I think you all in our grant application learned about um, the changes in HUD regulations and why that happened, so I won't go through that again with you. 
But in losing this funding, while we did lose three staff positions, thanks to your funding, we have been able to maintain our level of service and we're still helping the same number of families. And so that's great news. Um, and your funding has allowed us to um, use this time this year to find other long-term sustainable funding sources and we're having luck with that. So um, finally, if you want to learn more about Transition House next Friday, we have an open house tour of our shelter. Um, it's October 4th from 11.30 to 1, and you can get a flyer that looks like this at Transition House's table in the back if you'd like to come. We'd love to have you. So again, thank you so much for your support. My name's Brian Clark, and I'm with Catholic Charities. Um, our mission is to increase self-sufficiency and prevent hunger and homelessness. This past year, we served over 13,000 unduplicated clients countywide, which included nearly 6,000 households and 4,385 children aged 17 and under. 92% of those households are at or below the poverty level. Uh, traditionally, our demographic has been the working poor and those on fixed incomes, but since some of the service landscape has changed, we have found ourselves more and more providing services to the homeless. I would estimate we probably see about 50 people per week. Um, we've always provided help getting an ID and a birth certificate for people that need them, but a few years ago we started providing uh, clothing vouchers. Uh, the shelters, I think it was difficult for them to keep the clothing have a place for it and all that so we started doing vouchers and um, so word travels fast we didn't really need to publicize that uh, and now we we issue about 25 vouchers per day and we could do more but we tried to keep it like three per hour just so we don't the guys out at the thrift store were getting a little overwhelmed with the, the numbers of people we were sending over so we're still doing you know we do 25 per day uh, we have a parish nurse that, that keeps hours on Thursday mornings, and this has been really vital for some of our homeless clients. She's more like a medical social worker, so she can link them to referrals, and also um, she works with the Cecilia Foundation. The issues the clients bring to her are varied, but they're all exacerbated by homelessness. Uh, in the past, we've done a lot of dental referrals, and she's kind of, uh, that was kind of an under, or an overlooked thing when the Dentical went away a few years ago. We got flooded with people that needed dental care that wasn't available. And uh, through our work with the Cecilia Foundation, we've been able to, uh, to make a dent in that. Um, so kind of taking you through a typical client and what happens with them. I'm going to uh, talk about, we'll call him Phil. Uh, this is somebody that lived at the Falding Hotel. He originally started coming to us for food, to get food once a week. Our food program, we qualify people income-wise, and then they can come once a week and pick up food at our food pantry. And it's set up like a little store. I know a lot of you have been down to Haley Street and see what, have seen the pantry. Um, so it's a pretty busy place. We see between five and 600 people a week just in the pantry at Haley Street. And we've been really blessed in terms of support in getting food, donations from Trader Joe's and Gelson's and, and purchasing food from the food bank and getting free food from the food bank. But let's get back to Phil. So uh, at some point he started having dental problems and he came to the parish nurse and she started to guide him through that process of getting help with those, um, with those dental issues. He had so much that he still is, he still is in process, but um, the same person had an accident that, where his leg was injured. Now at the falling, I think, uh, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but the uh, elevator wasn't always working there. And he was uh, having problems going up the stairs with this leg injury he had. So we were able to start to work with the housing authority, write letters of recommendation for him, 
try to reach out and connect with as many people we could to let them know really what the issue was with him. He had been at the folding for like 17 years or something. So it really, I mean, he was really hoping to find a new place. So uh, he did eventually find a place. And once he found a place then, we were able to help him with rental assistance for the first month so he could afford movers to, to move him out of the folding. He had, you know, collected a lot of things over 17 years. He was a book person, so lots of books. Um, but, you know, we helped him with uh, rental assistance and then furniture, lamps, bookshelves that have made his new place a, really a home. And when I thought about this morning, it really did hit me, that idea of home and what we take for granted in terms of just the word home and what it means and that place where you come every day and you feel safe and to not have that is um, it's pretty humbling it's a pretty humbling thought so all through this time he still has been getting weekly food so what we do is we try to focus on the basic things of food shelter and clothing like i say we see between five and six hundred people a week uh, for food, we've got our thrift store where we do clothing vouchers and household items. Uh, when we, whenever we have a chance for somebody that's moving off the street to help with rental assistance, we do that and then, you know, try to come in with furniture to, to help them get settled. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I, you know, this work is really humbling. I mean, I could tell you a lot of stories about the people that I sit with and the sheer amount of pain that's out there, but also what can happen when somebody just sits and listens, you know? That's the only power I have in some degrees is to be able to sit there and listen. And I'm continually amazed by what that does but it takes time you know like Kathleen said building trust with someone especially some of our uh, mentally ill homeless clients that just trying to to make a connection and build trust it takes time and um, uh, so but I've seen somebody come in and walk out differently even if there was some not something tangible I could do for them just being heard and then seeing where we could go from there, people get lighter. So just the, you know, the importance of listening for me in this work is, and humility, really. So we work with the housing authorities of the city and the county and Santa Barbara Community Housing, County Social Services, Transition House, PATH, Rescue Mission, Salvation Army, Restorative Police, PATH Point, Tri-Counties Regional Center, People Self-Help Housing, you know, there's just a few. Um, people know where to find us. And uh, I encourage you, if you have a chance, to stop down at Haley Street sometime and just see how busy it is, you know? If nobody has any reason to be on Haley Street, they would have no idea what goes on down there <laughs> during the course of a day. And uh, we had the gas company out front today, and they, they said we can't. They, they want to cut a hole there to, to fix a gas leak, and they're like, we got to do this on a Sunday because there's too much traffic coming in and out, which we appreciated. So uh, our funding is mixed with some government foundation and individual donations, and we've depended more and more on donations in the current kind of funding uh, environment. It seems like there's a pendulum where social services are valued when things get bad enough uh, and, and more government money comes. But uh, we're in that place where it's not valued as much, and that's why foundations and, and groups such as yourselves have been so important to us to continue to, to do the work that we're doing. Um, we also generate revenue at our thrift store. So we're providing vouchers for people to go out and get uh, things to the thrift store. And it's been a vital stream of revenue for us. Uh, 
to be able to, to fund the programs through that at, while at the same time uh, helping people with clothes and household items and things like that. It's really a perfect, uh, perfect thing for us. So that's why uh, I think the Women's Fund recognized this with this grant of $50,000 for us to put a new roof on that thrift store, which was leaking and damaging the uh, insulation inside and, and just uh, is a really old, really old roof. So they've started work on that this week. And uh, it's been interesting navigating the parking lot but um, they're, they're out there and they're making, making progress. So I'm not sure what the time frame is on when they'll be finished, but they've been at it all this week. So, uh, okay.